Good morning all, good morning. It's now spot on 11 o'clock, so uh, let's get started. Uh, just uh, another little check, if you can just indicate to me through the chat box. Right, OK, folks, well, we're, we're looking at the currency wars yet again, that we are well and truly in the thick of uh, this year. We've had the big, 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 big move in the Swiss franc, and what that actually gave us was a real wake-up call that markets are indeed markets, and they do do some unexpected things. And um, what we've got to do as traders is that we've got to be cognizant of that, and uh, we need to be well and truly aware that um, markets can do can do um, what we what we would hope that they most certainly don't do, but of course they do do it very, very often, they actually revert to what the market is good at, and that is to identify risk where it appears. And where it is masked, as it most certainly was, with the, the Euro-Swiss exchange rate, it was being masked for a long period of time. There are those who were looking at the situation and, and were telling themselves it just cannot last in this way. And rather unfortunately, the majority of uh, those who got caught out in that debacle, well, you know, they were those who, uh, who, who just saw the short term and uh, haven't sort of looked really into the history of what markets will actually do from time to time. It was a support operation. It was an operation to support the euro against the Swiss franc in order to retain a competitive position. And it was at odds with the market. And the market always does win through um, looking back on all the various price supports that there have been. Then um, you know, they just collapse under the, uh, their, their own weight over a period of time. However, what we're going to look at uh, this morning are uh, various things which do just carry on from part one. And we're going to just look uh, a little further ahead. Now, we're looking at a chart. We're looking at a monthly chart of the dollar index, the DXY. And as we know, it has moved into a parabolic move, meaning that it's moved almost vertically. And if we look at that in relation to previous moves, then without a doubt, it's a really dramatic move. Now, you'll notice a blue band here. This is a technical band. It's based on uh, a whole series of things. But uh, uh, it suffice to say that there's a certain amount of Fibonacci within there. And that is actually telling us that it's really gone as far as it's going to go for the moment, where we can see this month we've got a little red candle. We've got um, only a, what are we, just a, a, well, not even two full trading days into the month yet. But it has not shot higher, and most likely we're going to see something of a pause. So that's the, uh, the, the dollar index, which... To all intents and purposes, this rise, this massive rise, as we can see from 80 up to uh, this 95, 96 region, is really quite unprecedented in the speed with which it has actually run through. And the effect that that's starting to have now on the, uh, on the world economy. More of that uh, in just a moment. But I just want to consider one or two uh, other things. First of all, let's just uh, take a, a brief glance at the euro. And the euro then is not quite the mirror image of, of what we've been seeing, but it's come down to this uh, support level. As you can see, it's, a, it's somewhat above the level that a good many commentators thought it would go to. There were those who were saying, oh, it's just going to drop to parity and it's going to do that in the space of just a few weeks. Um, but we had, um, we, we, we had the news out of the actual, the actual QE that is being pushed into the market. And uh, the amount of QE was more than the market was expecting. And so it's a little bit surprising that it didn't fall any further than it did. So it reached the 1200 level, which a good many commentators were looking at. But there were many more who thought it would go further. So what we've actually seen is that the news is indeed out. The news on the euro is indeed out. And uh, consequently, what we're seeing is something of a bounce back actually coming through. So um, what we're going to look at uh, right now, assuming I can pull up the right one, we're going to look at... Hmm. 
Here we go. Let's bring this across. And we're going to look at the Commitment to Traders report. Now, Commitment to Traders report is showing us that the leverage money is massively, massively short. And the degree of shorts, these are the little orange candles in relation to the, the little blue candles, I should just call them histograms, of course, is still very, very, very large indeed. So there are a massive number of shorts still in this market. And they're all assuming, they're all of them assuming that what we're going to see then is a further heavy collapse. Now, that may well be the case. That, that may well happen. And we will see this dropping down to the parity zone. Now, is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? Well, if we just consider for a moment what has been going on with, uh, with Greece. Um, well, that, that's an interesting comment, uh, DB. And um, I, I think I would actually have to say that I agree with you. I agree with you wholeheartedly there. So let's just look at one or two of the, of the reasons for that. Well, I suppose that what we can uh, look at is that we've, um, we've got a degree of disappointment in the market. And that degree of disappointment is that it, it just the euro has not collapsed in the way in which so many expected that it would. This is the daily chart where we've got the big, big decline. And the major decline from this level of 124, let's just put a vertical, uh, a vertical line through there, where we had uh, that move is where the market suddenly cottoned on to the fact that maybe this time Mario Draghi is actually serious and he's going to do something about it. Rather than just jawboning about QE, the market then realized that uh, it, was, it was going to be happening. Then, of course, we had the, uh, the, the Swiss situation and, of course, the collapse which ran down. Look at that. We've got 1,000 pips, 124 down to 114, down to uh, 12, so 1,200 pips, nicely signaled, and on down it went. What is happening right now? Well, yeah, it's, it, it's pausing. It's pausing. So let's just look at this on a weekly chart. And uh, again, look, we can see that the decline, an unprecedented decline with the speed and the distance that it actually traveled, meaning that um, it's highly likely we could well see something of a fairly spirited bounce. Now, let's just consider what's going on with the Greek situation. We've got the uh, elections that came through, came through a week ago, and um, we now know that there is a radical party in Greece. What are they going to do? Well, what they were talking about was to say that well, we want to stay in the euro, but we actually want a 50% haircut on the debt. And, uh, you know, that, that'll work out quite nicely, won't it? Well, Angela Merkel said, <laughs> on your bike, it's just not going to happen. It is not going to happen at all. And, of course, we've got to consider that Angela Merkel uh, is, to a very great extent, in a very vulnerable position. Because there are parties throughout Europe and in Germany as well if you would believe, um, uh, based uh, on the popular press, there are parties in Germany who would be only too pleased, who would be only too pleased to um, allow the, uh, the, the, Greece, uh, the, the Greeks to just disappear from the uh, European scene because they look on the Greek economy as an endless drain on Germany's sort of prowess, if you like, in the world, um, and, and, of course, on their reserves. So, <laughs> radical. Well, what is radical? Absolutely, you know. Is, is radical sense <laughs> in this context? Um, but radical, I suppose, in this context has just got to mean that it, it's going against the ECB's um, assumption of uh, how things have, have got to pan out. So, let's just consider for a moment, if Greece did decide that uh, they were actually going to follow through. And the net result is that they don't reach any accommodation at all with the ECB. 
I rather suspect there's going to be quite a major fudge that, that uh, moves ahead. So it ends up being a default, but it won't be called a default so that uh, <laughs> credit default swaps, you know, those infamous CDSs are not actually triggered, but the money never gets paid back. How about that? I guess that that's what we're probably going to end up finding um, will work through. But let's just think for a minute. If Greece does decide that for whatever reason they just cannot stay with the euro, it will, of course, be a disaster. It will be a total disaster for the Greek economy, because unless some of the stories that we're hearing is that they're going to end up with a pact with the Russians, <laughs> then um, if, if you've got to imagine they're sort of going back to the drachma overnight, well, you know, they haven't got any drachmas. It, it, it's got no basis, no foundation in, say, gold or, or, or whatever. But if they could get the Russians to backstop the currency, then just maybe they, 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 it, they might pull it off. Personally, I think it's very, very unlikely that's going to happen. But what would then happen to the euro? Is it going to collapse? Are we going to find that uh, European banks realizing, long last, that they are just not going to get any money out of, um, out of Greece? Are they going to collapse? Well, I guess that one or two are going to come under severe pressure. But of course, this latest round of QE has helped um, ameliorate that situation quite considerably because it does improve balance sheets um, that there are tucked away. And um, what, uh, what, what could well happen then is that if we don't get a big, big banking collapse in Europe because of them dropping out, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, it was most definitely a lot of irresponsible lending. So who, who do you blame? Who do you, who do you blame? If, if, if you or I went along to... <laughs> You know, negotiate a mortgage or a loan at any bank, they are going to want to be exceedingly cautious. And the amount of hoops that uh, home buyers have to go through now, which they didn't have to go through just over a year ago, is absolutely incredible. So if Lloyds Bank or Barclays were to loan Joe Bloggs £100,000, for whatever reason, and Joe Bloggs couldn't actually pay that money back, whose fault is it that the loan was made in the first place? Is it Joe Bloggs for actually taking the loan, or is it the idiot bank for actually lending to somebody who's not creditworthy? Well, <laughs> it's almost a philosophical discussion, but um, you, you've hit the nail on the head, and uh, irresponsible lending, maybe it was. Yeah, and, and that uh, black hat is is what I rather believe that he wants what's best for both Greece and the Europeans, and uh, you know what they don't want to happen, they they don't want to give Europe a bloody nose. They actually want to work with them because they want to survive in in some shape or form. That would appear to be the most likely. But stay with me for a moment. Stay with me for a moment. Supposing that Greece did split away and European banks did not collapse because of it. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, what's going to happen to the strength of the euro? Well, it would become incredibly strong. Now, if it became incredibly strong, what would that do for the German export machine? It's going to mean that their exports are more difficult to make. And uh, the, the revenue will be, in German terms, Euro terms, that much less. So it's not going to help the Germans any to allow the perception of a sort of a Deutschmark-like Euro coming back in. It's not going to help them one little bit. But, of course, Angela Merkel is having to weigh up her own political prospects of making sure that she remains re-elected, and she has got a lot of critics within Germany. So interesting times, very interesting times, but just maybe, just maybe, 
the real bad news, or at least the, the news that we're aware of in Europe, is actually out. And this little chart pattern at the moment, which is setting itself up for, for a rather interesting little triangle, just might want to follow through and put in a sensible bounce. That is exactly what the market is starting to say right now. And it's telling us that both technically and fundamentally, we've got that massive short position that needs to be unwound. It needs to be unwound before there can be another major lurch lower. So could it be time to wade into the euro right now? So there we go. That's the question that I want to pose to you. And uh, at the moment, it's very rhetorical. There is no uh, uh, clear and plain answer to it. And uh, we've, we've seen that where we get these currency machinations and uh, sort of mentioning mortgages, where we've got uh, countries such as, well, a good many of the uh, Eastern Euro European countries have managed to denominate their, um, their mortgages in Swiss francs, in Swiss francs. So, you know, if you, if you had a equivalent say, of a 100,000 euro mortgage and you took it out in Swiss francs, well, all of a sudden, that mortgage is going to be, you know, 125, 130,000 and more. We find that, found that one or two governments are actually looking after their own citizens and saying that we will actually absorb the, uh, we will absorb the, uh, the pain on that for you. So we always want to be exceedingly cautious and uh, we're investing uh, abroad uh, quite simply because um, there can be, there can be these big, big machinations. All, uh, all bond funds, for instance, hedge. They put currency hedges on. They always put currency hedges on to make sure that they take away any market risk. They just want the yield. They just want the yield. And, and perhaps some sort of capital appreciation. They do not want currency risk. Now, let's just, um, let's just switch over to the yen for a moment, because the yen uh, is really quite interesting, and it um, uh, clearly applies to um, oil, which uh, you, were, you were saying there, um, that oil has, uh, has bounced with a very similar pattern. Oh, yeah, yeah. Good point there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So-called professionals got their fingers burnt having uh, a loan for gherkin in Swiss francs. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The gherkin is not the thing you find in the garden, but it's that uh, amazing building in, in London. And uh, yeah, you know, a, a good many professionals get blindsided. You know, they, they don't do their homework. They don't do their due diligence uh, quite enough. And uh, so, so often it can catch people out, as we have seen. Right now, let's just just consider the uh, the yen for a moment, because the yen, oil, and the Canadian dollar at the moment are inextricably linked. If I can get the word out, uh, but they haven't always been linked in quite such way that they are right now. What we have seen then is that the U.S. dollar against the Japanese yen has gone up like crazy, and we all know the story that the Japanese, what they desperately wanted was to try to get some growth in their economy. Now, you know, acres of uh, newsprint of the blogosphere have written all about um, why they're trying to do it uh, because they've been in the doldrums for years. And, uh, you know, of course, there are a good many commentators who are saying that, well, with the amount of QE that's been going on in the Western world, that's exactly we're all going to become Japanese. We're all going to stagnate for the next 20 years without any, any uh, meaningful growth, but with just an increase in debt. Now, what about technically? Let's just look at this technically for a moment. Um, we've had this big, big rise that has been running now for a good two, nearly three years. And uh, the move, again, has been really quite dramatic. It hasn't quite doubled, but um, it, the move has been substantial. And technically, it's moved up to a level that... It was at back there in 07, 06, 07. And we all know that, uh, or we should do, that we're most likely to get a reversal or a pause in the level of, at the level of a previous high or a previous low 
And we've now got on the monthly an Harami pattern. It is, in Western terms, an inside month. So it's an uncertain month. And what very often happens with Haramis or inside candles is that we get a breakout. And if we get a breakout on the downside, the chances are it might go lower. If we get a breakout on the upside, the chances are that it will then carry on higher. Now, that may or may not happen in either way. It might just go sideways for a while. But what is actually happening is that there is a pause and it has stopped moving up. Meaning that the US dollar has either stopped getting stronger or indeed the Japanese yen has decided that it's stopped going weaker or maybe it's a combination of both. So what about the Japanese? Well, they're getting political rumblings. And there is a suggestion that just maybe, maybe what the Swiss have done could possibly be the way to go in Japan. And that we're getting those little rumblings actually coming out of various parts of Japan. Now, if that was the case, then this whole experiment could get reversed. But politically at the moment, Abe and, uh, you know, those who currently are um, pulling the strings are in a very, very solid position. So that is most unlikely to happen. But, but let's now just consider what's been going on with the oil price. If we just take a quick glance at the oil price, what we know about it is that, yeah, you know, it, it's halved. It's, it's more than halved in value. But we're now getting a bounce. And this bounce, you know, as you were saying, DB, is looking very, very similar to what is actually going on with the euro. Now, is this bounce going to be a substantial bounce or not? But one imagines that this level of 45, which was being talked about by, you know, we are told, the Saudis, that 45 was the level that they wanted it to go to. And we're now finding that, yeah, you know, there's a bit of a bounce going on. So just maybe it's reached something for the floor, at least for the moment. And are we going to see a bigger bounce? Well, if we do happen to see a bigger bounce, then it just might help the prospects of the yen. And why is that? Because the Japanese have to import pretty well, well, not all of it, but they, they have to import the lion's share of their energy requirements. And consequently, we have found then that uh, certainly over the end of last year and this new year, we got a triangle pattern setting up. And this triangle pattern setting up just on this daily is suggesting that there will be at some point, a breakout as it gets a little bit nearer the apex. Now, it's probably got a bit to go. So there's a possibility that if the oil price will remain weak and not go shooting back up 60, 65, 70 and so on, that the cost of importing oil into the Japanese economy just might remain reasonably low, and that could have the desired effect on the Japanese economy to reduce their import prices and consequently just might help their domestic economy to grow somewhat. So that's one of the effects there, which is uh, undoubtedly being affected, uh, affecting the Japanese. So we've got a combination then of the oil price, got a combination of uh, what is going on politically. So the foregone conclusion that the market is telling us that um, also, if we just take another little look at the COT report, is showing us that there is still a massive short position on the Japanese yen. If we don't find that the 
this chart keeps on going up, what are those shorts going to do? They're going to have to cover. And that could well mean that this chart could well plummet. It could well plummet. If that would be the case. Right, now let's just go and switch over this time to... Bear with me a second. This one, the CAD yen, the CAD yen. Now, why do I mention the CAD yen? Because just considering the oil price, the Canadians export a lot of oil. It's their major export. It's their major earner. And what we've actually seen is that the Canadian dollar has actually been moving up or had been moving up until until the oil price crash. Now, this particular chart, then, it's not only the Canadian dollar, it's also the Japanese yen. And this previous move that ran on up with the Canadian dollar against the Japanese yen was more a feature of the Japanese yen weakening. But then we get this peak, and we get this peak at about the time when the oil price was no longer going on up. So we've got a vertical line there. We got it in December. So what we then found is that this one just collapses on down and the realization that the low oil price is very, very badly affecting the Canadian economy. And we're now getting stories that uh, the layouts are really getting quite substantial. And Canada has got quite a few little structural problems that um, our, uh, our dear central bank governor Mark Carney, presided over a massive increase in domestic debt. And that massive increase in domestic debt is overhanging all sorts of problems, and they would dearly like to have a reduction in that domestic debt, which is largely, largely taken on by incredibly high mortgages which in relation to earnings are now all looking the wrong way. And so the Canadian economy has got all sorts of structural difficulties. So what we've then seen is that with this oil price collapse, the Canadian dollar has also collapsed. It has collapsed also in relation to the Japanese yen, which is now starting to pick up a wee bit of strength. Only a wee bit hasn't yet broken out of that triangle that we're looking at. Technically, what have we got? Well, we've got several things. We've got a, a neat little Elliott wave move. It's a five wave move. And the distance traveled by wave five in relation to wave one is very, very similar. And that's very often the case. In harmonic terms, it's at a false break reversal level. And this false break reversal level is good for monthly charts, daily charts, etc. <laughs> now, I'm sure he didn't tell Osborne that. He tried to keep that one uh, quiet. And, and we're seeing now that technically we've got one of these inside months last month, the Harami, and this month, it's largely today, sorry, this daily chart, we are breaking out. We are breaking out on the upside. So yesterday wasn't the breakout day. Sorry, today is the breakout day. And it's looking really quite encouraging now for a bit of a snapback whilst that oil price attempts to uh, recover. 
So there we are. Um, an interesting one to watch. If uh, you were to or come down to the, the, uh, the shorter term charts, we can actually see that uh, we've had a really good run today. Just look at this, bouncing off, bouncing off harmonic levels, bouncing off the Fib Finder. It's now popped up for a full straight reversal level on the upside. It's hit a Gartley. So just maybe the move today, which has uh, moved through a nice little 100 pips, might well, might well be over for the day. But it's one to look at because it's got the potential to recover somewhat further. So there we go. That's, um, that's that uh, uh, little set of, uh, of charts. It, it's also worth just uh, considering, and I'm going to go back to that uh, dollar index, that what is the effect of this strong US dollar. And we, we, we're getting suggestions that, yeah, ab absolutely, absolutely, good point, good point. There is this uh, expectation Fed is going to hike, hike rates. We, we, had the, we had the minutes last week, and um, we had the sort of the, uh, the, the Janet Yellen sort of interview. And um, she was starting to pour cold water on that idea. Failing to deliver so far, there's going to be, what is it, March the 15th, 16th, is it, 15th, something like that, where we'll get the next, we'll get the next uh, announcement coming through. And commentators appear to be more or less split. On one side, they're saying that, yeah, you know, the, the, the Americans are definitely going to increase rates. And so there is an expectation that if that were to be the case, then this level of 94, 95 is going to be surpassed. It's going to be up to 100. But then, of course, there are those who, who, who take the argument that you're putting forward there, DB, which is quite the opposite, that the numbers coming out of the, of the uh, US economy um, are really, you know, are really not showing that Growth is real. It's all smoke and mirrors, they're saying. And so that um, it just hasn't come through and uh, soft data from the USA. And that, I, well, I don't know, I just sort of feel in my bones that that is the most likely scenario that will actually come through. And of course, where you've got a strong dollar, then it, it does. It does things like putting pressure on commodities and, and can they actually... Uh, hike this year. Well, why why have they got a very, very strong dollar? Well, they've got a strong dollar because of the perceived weakness in, in Europe and the lack of growth in Europe. Well, Europe doesn't grow. We, we know that. Um, you know, if we just look into our history books, it, it, it's not a high growth economy. It, it probably never will be. And so that's one of the reasons why this has been moving on up. You can also say that the decline in the oil price has um, helped the U.S. economy. You know, there are parts of it which it hasn't helped, namely oil companies and exploration. But one of the effects is that there is a massive, massive carry trade on the U.S. dollar. So if you can imagine that if you ran, let's put you in the position of being a, a a chief investment, oh, sorry, a, 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 a CFO or a CEO of a Russian company, and you have got some fairly substantial dollar, dollar loans, and you're finding that most of your income is coming from oil, well, you're going to be in deep shtuck, because not only is the oil price falling going to mean that your profits are going to be sort of considerably lower, if not non-existent? So you haven't got any rubles to actually pay the debt. And what you find is that what you thought was a uh, million dollars a month in interest payments that you're making, all of a sudden, it's two million dollars because the ruble has collapsed. And if your income is in ruble, your company is going to go to the wall. 
Now, was that one of the reasons for allowing the US dollar to go higher? Was that one of the reasons for allowing the oil price to collapse? Could it be that this whole game was predicated on the fact that what the Americans desperately want is for the Russian economy to collapse? Well, there we are, another little rhetorical talking point. But what we've got to consider right now is will this continue on the upside? And the pattern is actually starting to tell us that just maybe it's ready for a pullback. And that's what the euro chart is telling us, that it's probably ready for a pullback and there needs to be something of a move to uh, just unwind a fair bit of this uh, current position that we can see that the market's in. So, you know, that's the carry trade. And the carry trade is, is working against all of those loans which were taken out in countries other than the US where their earnings are in currencies other than the US dollar and where they've got an increasing dollar then it's causing them big, big problems. <laughs> yeah, the Chinese, of course, um, you know, we've, we've uh, all sorts of things coming out of China. Bear with me half a moment. Sorry about that, guys. Yeah, so, um, you know, it, it, it's entirely possible that the, the, the strong dollar has caused so many problems outside of uh, the U.S. that uh, just maybe, just maybe, the U.S. are going to start to be aware of that problem, but it's not going to do, um, <laughs> it's not going to do them any good at all. <laughs> Absolutely, the PBOC. Yeah, yeah. Telling me to telling me to be quiet and uh, and, and, and not uh, come up with all these subversive comments. Yeah, you know. Well, why not? <laughs> why not? I think that's probably slightly unlikely. I think it's slightly unlikely. Um, you know, we've got all those stories that the Russians are um, doing everything they can to increase their gold reserves. So you know, we're in the midst of all of these fiat currencies. Fiat currencies which are based on nothing more than a promise to pay the bearer. And that's it. You know, behind that promise, what is there? Uh, not a great deal. And, uh, you know, we're, we're being told that uh, certainly the Chinese and certainly the, uh, the Russians have been increasing their gold reserves really quite substantially so that there will be life after the euro. There will be life after the petro US dollar, and uh, we, we just might well find that um, you know, there is a long game being played, and uh, the short term uh, game is the one that the US are playing against um, Russia, and the long term game is the one being played by Russia and, um, and the Chinese. Perhaps I'm giving them uh, far too much credit. Right, now what about gold? Well, gold is, um, you know, we we're just mentioning gold and it's the alternative currency, always used to be the currency. If we sort of look back in the history books, then the gold standard was great for sort of keeping inflation down, but it wasn't terribly great for um, economies that um, really wanted to uh, expand in all sorts of different ways. And uh, it, it, created, uh, it created all sorts of difficulties. Now, technically, let's just have a little consideration of what's going on here with the gold price. Technically, we've had it bounce. So that's first leg of the bounce. It's then come back somewhat. So, you know, you can see that I'm putting in a series of waves here. We've then got this superb wave that has run on up. And, of course, the uh, Russian situation, the Donetsk situation, Ukraine... Um, which is 
it's all going to be added to somewhat with um, NATO now setting up in various Baltic states and uh, Eastern European states. They're going to set up a number of areas where tanks are going to be uh, set. And in fact, I even suspect the UK, I followed a convoy of, uh, I think they were getting on for about eight or ten tanks. I followed them um, last Friday, as a matter of fact, all working their way down to Southampton docks. I wonder what they were going to do there. Perhaps jump on a ship and they'd be shipped off to, um, off to Poland and then taken across to, well, Bulgaria. Estonia, Latvia, etc. So what I'm looking at here on gold is this move. We've had a wave one, a wave two. We've got a decent wave three. This then could be wave four. And just maybe we're going to get another a wave five. <laughs> Absolutely. So it looks highly likely that we're going to get another leg higher in gold. Remains to be seen, of course, if this is going to be a substantial leg, enough to really make the difference and uh, run this one so much higher than the 1400 level that it needs to breach in order to change the trend. Now, if we look at this level, that is the critical level. It well, it's very high. So it's just under 1400. And this rally, this fifth wave, one imagines that it's going to find some difficulty getting above previous peaks. But if it can get above 1,400, then I think that is going to be really quite critical for a turnaround in the fortunes of gold. Longer term, I think we're still in deflationary land, and that's not good for gold. But short term, I guess that uh, if the dollar weakens and we get uh, a little bit more saber-rattling saber or a lot more saber-rattling coming out of Ukraine, we could possibly find that um, this, uh, this dollar has got, um, well, probably a good hundred on the, on the upside. And of course, silver, which is the one to trade rather than gold, which will move in percentage terms considerably more than gold, then silver could be a real interesting one to, uh, to back. Pop that down to the daily chart. And what we can see is that we've got wave one, wave two, wave three, and we've got a wave four potentially in the making here. Right, so that's that one. Now, um, no... Uh, little comment on what is going on with the currency wars would be complete without just considering for a moment what is going on with the Australian dollar. Because the Australian dollar, we woke up to a further collapse this morning. And this was it. So there we are, we've got the daily chart of the Australian dollar down, 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 down. Now, um, the interest rate. Uh, commentator was saying an unexpected interest rate cut, 2.25%. Now, rather like the Canadians, the Australians are in a bind. They're in a real bind because their major export market is China. China is slowing down. In fact, China had to introduce liquidity uh, last month. And uh, exactly, was it really unexpected? So... They had to introduce liquidity, which suggested that, whoops, they've got a bit of a problem. And part of that problem is that they've spent far too much money building cities which uh, are more or less empty. And consequently, all of the, the iron ore, particularly iron ore, and other aggregates that uh, have buoyed the Australian economy and has meant that house prices in Australia have gone to ridiculous multiples of average earnings. Um, much the same as Canada, you know, Canada had uh, had oil and they got carried away. Australia had uh, China and got carried away with it and have overdone it. So they then find that their major export market has more or less collapsed. So the money then, that their balance of payments is starting to go the wrong way and 
they're finding that their unemployment level is creeping up quite substantially. So for domestic considerations, they have done the sensible thing and they have joined the European party, if you like. They have joined the, the Western world with having to reduce interest rates in an attempt to try and buoy up their own domestic economy. And they've taken the decision at the risk of refueling their housing boom. So where does this leave then the Australian dollar? Well, if we just run this, this out uh, a wee bit, we can actually see that we've got various different levels where this market could run to. We've got a grid on here. And this grid is showing us that price has actually sliced through some of the important levels. We are right now, if we look left on this, in the region of the levels that there were okay, at the end of 05 and the beginning of 06, going back quite a long way. And you know, the lows, we can see the lows, have been considerably lower. So the Australian economy is one to look at really, really carefully and also look at what is going on with their major export market, China. Because what we could find is that in this area, we could be on for a bounce. And indeed, we've actually seen something of a bounce going on so far today. You look at the 30 minute chart, we've got a massive gap. There was a wonderful trade earlier today on trading part of this bounce back up. Is there going to be more? Where we've got a gap, gaps tend to be filled. So maybe the big move has gone as far as it's going to go for the moment. But keep watching this one because it's, it's an incredibly good charting market. It's a very good one for running the 30-minute play that we, uh, we, we do pretty well every day. And um, it's one where we can actually get quite a lot of the information, Google searches, etc. We can get <clears throat> quite a lot of the fundamental information, which certainly does help with building up the bigger picture. Right. OK, chaps. Well, that's uh, that's it for now. And uh, do take great care out there. But I think we've got opportunities, certainly in the Australian dollar. And before we leave this um, completely behind, let's just look at the US dollar CAD. And the US dollar CAD is setting itself up for a marvelous trade. Just look at this one. It's run right up to this previous level. It's put in a very interesting potential bat level, bringing this down to the daily chart. And what you are about to see is this. We're seeing now a correction. We get the move up. It went sort of parabolic, hit some, uh, hit some important harmonic levels. And what we can now see <clears throat> is that price has actually come off really quite nicely. The <clears throat> four hour chart is showing we've got a superb little five wave move and uh, we had an opportunity yesterday. We got yet another one this morning. And if we find that that US dollar, the dollar index decides to come off further and if we find that the oil price recovers somewhat more, then there could be quite a bit more on the downside here. So where do I see the next support zone? Well, we're actually getting pretty, pretty close to it right now. But what very often will happen is that we will find that the next support zone is going to be in the region of the start of the last wave up. So you know, potential support there at uh, 100, 125, 130 pips lower than where it currently is. Right. OK, guys. Well, um, that's it for now. Many thanks for being with me. And um, I will uh, just leave you with the Traders Class homepage. And um, 
hope you've enjoyed the presentation and uh, look forward to being, being with you again next, next month.